I told you that we would talk about three people over these three Sundays. And we talked a little bit, not a whole lot, but a little bit about John Calvin last week. Um, John Calvin got us thinking about grace again, as I speak historically, as a church, as God's church. Um, even if I don't agree with him on some of his views, and I do not, um, I do appreciate that he put God's focus on grace again like it hadn't been mentioned in probably a thousand years to that level. Uh, probably all the way back to the fourth century, a guy named Augustine who really uh, taught a, a lot about grace. But, but Calvin comes along and, and says, grace is irresistible. I love to say that, I just don't agree with that. I, in one sense, I love it because yes, the, the grace of God is so irresistible, only some people resist it. Now, I don't know why. I don't know why they do, but some people choose not to uh, receive the grace of God. Uh, and it simply leads to what I would say is, is a wrong understanding of Scripture, uh, predeterminism. That means God knows who's going to be saved. It's already decided and nothing can be done to change that. I just simply disagree with that because it does not line up with the sweep of Scripture. Clearly, the Bible teaches that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so, um, but I, I appreciate John Calvin for his work. And next week, on October 31st, we will be talking specifically about Martin Luther. I hope you'll be back for the close of this series. But today, I want to mention a guy's name that you may have never heard about. His name is Huldrych Zwingli. Huldrych Zwingli from Switzerland. Uh, he lived in dis different places in the country of Switzerland, but he was, he was most famous for his ministry in Zurich, Switzerland. And I want to read um, from Matthew chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. If you'll follow along with me, it'll be on the screen also. And if you want to read on your device, you're welcome to do that. Or if you have the Bible open in front of you, certainly. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The words of Jesus. Some of the most beautiful words you'll ever read, right? I don't know, you have to be like me. These are possibly some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. And Jesus says, come to me, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden, guess what? It is light. You will find rest for your souls. How many of us need rest for our souls? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Huldrych Zwingli is a hero of mine. Uh, even though just like Calvin, there are things I don't find agreement with him on. For instance, Zwingli... Um, wasn't quite sure what to do with the concept of hell in the Bible. He didn't believe it the same way that, that I see the Bible teaching it. But, but I love so much about, about Zwingli. Um, and, and the reason I chose Matthew chapter 11 is that it's, um, this is something that he enjoyed preaching. I know that for a fact. Um, and the reason I know that is that when Zwingli went to Zurich, um, he, he really went against the norm. You see, in those days, everybody followed what the Catholic Church said to teach, and, and there was the gospel lesson for the day, and that's what was taught. It was part of a lectionary. And Zwingli comes to Zurich, and he says, you know what, we're going to do things a little different. I'm just going to open the book of Matthew, and we're going to start to read. And he taught verse by verse by verse through the book of Matthew. Um, he did what today we refer to as expositional teaching. Um, a, a pastor who, who stays with one text and, and discerns it and brings truth out from it and moves systematically through, we call that expositional teaching. That's what I always do. I don't always do it this way. Uh, and, for instance, Calvary Chapel is, is wonderful at this. They will move through entire books of the Bible, teaching verse by verse. I'm not as 
systematic in my approach, but I have a great value for that, and I have a great value for staying in the context of Scripture because I believe that's the way that it speaks to us best. And so Zwingli, he was way ahead of his time, an expository uh, teacher. I want to put a picture on the screen. This is the Grossmünster, uh, which is, um, that's a German word. It means great minster. It's a, a Romanesque style Protestant church that still exists in Zurich today. And it, it really, it, it, I don't think you can read, but it has, it has letters in the etching um, and it, it basically says these words over the door, come to me all who labor and who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's because that was one of Zwingli's favorite scriptures. And uh, so, uh, by, by the way, great, uh, great minster. And so minster would be like uh, in, in Europe, a, a big church. Um, for instance, you're, you're familiar with Westminster Abbey. Well, that's a, a notorious, famous church. And this is the great minster. And I, um, I, I want you to be careful because it's pronounced gross minster. And I don't want you to think that it says gross minister, okay? <laughs> uh, so I don't want you to call me the gross minister or anything like that. But Zwingli... He loved music. He could play several instruments. He, uh, he played the harp, he played the violin, the flute, the dulcimer, and an instrument called the hunting horn. And he would sometimes amuse the children uh, from his congregation by playing the lute, which was sort of a, a stringed instrument, the, the predecessor to guitar. And, and then he was also known as the fifer. He would play a pipe, like he's the Pied Piper. And, and the kids just loved him. But I, I really am amazed by him because in August of 1519, and see if this doesn't sound familiar to our day today, in August of 1519, there was a, a horrible plague that swept throughout Europe. One in four people died. Many people fled for their lives. But Zwingli stayed and ministered to his people doing funerals every day of the week. In September of that year, he even caught the disease and he thought that he would die. He described it in this poem that he wrote and it was called Zwingli's Pest Lead. It means the plague song. And he thought he was going to die, so he wrote this poem that had three parts. The onset of the illness, the closeness of death, but then the joy of recovery. And that's where I feel like we are as a nation. We are in the joy of recovery and the joy of recovery as a church. Now I want to, I want to point out three, three things that we could learn from Zwingli. And they don't specifically connect to Matthew 11, 28 through 30, but in the end you'll see actually they do. And here's the first one. No fake fasting. No fake fasting. Um, I told you last week that the trigger for the Reformation was when Martin Luther tacked the 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door. And that is true. But you want to know, this is really interesting. The trigger for, for the Reformation in Switzerland, you want to know what it was? It was called the Affair of the Sausages. Did he just say sausages? He just said sausages. Because in 1522, in the season of Lent, when the Catholic Church was saying to everyone, you must fast, which is wonderful. The fast, fasting is wonderful, right? I mean, many of you have experienced it. And, and if the Lord calls you to a season of fasting, there's nothing better the only thing I'd say about it is make sure that you're, you're just doing it with the right heart, that you're not trying to treat God like some slot machine in the sky and demanding things, but you're trying to more have... It has, fasting has to do with God getting my own attention about what needs to change in me, and more so than getting God's attention. And, and so, but anyway, in 1522, Zwingli comes to Zurich and he says, it's just, this isn't right. You know, to be required to fast, it feels very legalistic. I don't think our hearts are in it the right way. He was remembering Isaiah 58, 
where Isaiah the prophet said, is this what you call a fast? You think just because you're doing without food, you're fasting, but you're not, you don't care about the widows and the orphans? Uh, you're not caring for the people who are less fortunate than you? You trample on them as you continue to try to climb to the top? You call that fasting? That's not fasting. And so in the setting in which there was a lot of turmoil already within the Catholic Church, he says, you know what? Rather than fasting, come to church this Sunday. And so on March 9th, 1522, Holdrick Zwingli smoked a couple of massive large sausages, sliced them up, and passed them around as a feast to everybody at church that day. No fake fasting. I, I Again, I just reiterate, fasting is wonderful, but let's make sure our hearts are in the right place, right? Number two, no false purity. No false purity. It was later that same year, 1522. What a year. Later that same year in July, he got married. A priest. Hello? <laughs> he says, you know what? All of us are pretending that we're so pure, but we're just humans. And, and rather than burn with passion... I'm praying about it and God's leading me. I'm going to get a wife and I encourage all of you other priests to get a wife. <laughs> what a, what a um, man. I mean, he was a go-getter, Zwingli. He was, he was like way ahead of the curve because as you know, clerical celibacy is a really important component in the Catholic Church. I have a lot of respect for it, but I will be the first to say my goodness, way back in 1522, Holdrick Zwingli was trying to get the church to change, and the last three decades my heart has been broken, as has yours, as numerous over and over again. There have been so many uh, failures on the part of priests in the Catholic Church, and not just Catholics, let's say it, across all denominational lines. We need purity. But I really, I just love him. He says, clerical celibacy um, is just not a good idea unless God calls you to it. It should not be mandated. And then number three, no false idols. No false idols. So it was December of 1522. What a year. When... Three days before Christmas, on December 22nd, came the order, and it led to months of back and forth discussion between Zurich, uh, between Zwingli and Zurich, and and some of his followers, with the upper elite of the religious establishment, back and forth until finally, in September of the next year, 1523. He said, look, no more praying to idols. We pray to God. We, we don't worship and bow down to some statue. As wonderful as saints have been in the past, and praise God for them, but I will not bow down in worship to someone who's on the same level as me. I will worship the living God. So I pray to God in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, by the vehicle of His Holy Spirit, but I will not bow down to any false idol. Amen. And so, you and I, in our day, we, we need to have that same mindset. No fake fasting. No false purity. No false idols. And, and watch out for that last one, because sometimes idols will sneak up on you, right? We, you know, I could take you to parts of the world, missions trips I've been on, where there are um, shamans and witch doctors and people who burn incense to idols and there are liberal wooden statues and stone images and, and they will get down and try to crawl great distances to reach out and touch it or they will cut themselves until they bleed uh, to worship this false idol. Those are the obvious ones. 
And there are parts of the world that are crawling with the obvious ones. I'm thankful we don't have it on that level, though it's increasing in our nation. But also be aware of any other thing that tries to set itself up as more important than Jesus. Nothing can be an idol in my life. Amen? Amen. And so Matthew 11, 28, read it with me one last time. Come to me. Look at this. Come to me. Don't go to a false idol. Come to me. Jesus says, come directly to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give my rest. Take my yoke upon you. There is another kind of yoke that you could put on yourself. This, this yoke of uh, legalism that I, I have to do this. Something that's being required of me. For instance, fasting when my heart's not really in it, but I'm trying to check it off so that I can do all of my religious stuff. No, no, no. Come to me, not to idols, and take my yoke. No fake legalism. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And then you will find rest for your souls. That's true purity, not fake purity. Not, um, you know, if, if I can be, uh, as, as a member of, of the clergy, if I can be celibate, then I will be pure. No, no. Take my yoke upon me, on you, and learn from me. My ways are gentle, and you're going to find rest for your soul. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So as we close this morning, here's the main thing. And, and each week I like to really bring our focus to one main thing. Something that you can take with you. A truth that you can put to practice this next week immediately. And here it is. The main thing is this. Traditions are great. I mean, they really are. But don't just do something because other people are doing it. Make sure that you seek the Lord and that, that He gives you guidance and wisdom for your life. I really do mean that. The traditions are great. Uh, there's a side of me. I love ceremony. Um, times have changed since, since I first began in ministry. Um, I do remember the days when uh, it was Communion Sunday and uh, the pastor and all of the ushers, we all dressed to the nines. We got the suit and the tie and would come up when we had the the gold and silver plated uh, communion uh, and we'd take it off and pass it down and then they would move throughout the sanctuary and serve one another. And boy, there's a part of me I just go, well, I really love that. I love ceremony. I love weddings. I, I love to see beautiful, formal things. But traditions, they're great, but don't just do something just to do it. Make sure that you're following the voice of the Lord. Most people are simply born into a religious practice. I mean, they're just born into this thing and they, and they just do it. I, I heard yesterday on public radio a, a, a skit that was by a lady that was Armenian. She was from Armenia and she was... Um, she was getting married and come to find out her, you know, her, her uh, fiancé was, was not Christian. He, she said, well, have you been baptized? No, I haven't been baptized. I don't think. Well, let me call my mom. Have I been baptized? No, son, you are a heathen, is what she said. You're a heathen. <laughs> oh, I, I haven't been baptized. So it just kind of became a comical thing. Well, we've got to get you baptized. Like, we've got to have the church, and we've got to have the candle, and you're, they're going to hold up this candlestick, and then you're going to have to kiss that thing. It's part of the ceremony, and you, we, we do this. And it just became such a ritualistic thing. Don't just do things because they're tradition, but do it really because it gives you life in Jesus Christ. And let God lead you. And I'd like, Pastor Mo, if you could just provide a, a little background guitar would be great. As I, I'm closing us with a word of prayer. 
I really mean this prayer. I, I simply am going to ask God to lead us and to guide our steps and direct us. So I invite you to bow your head with me and pray along with me in your heart. As I'm, as I'm praying, I'm not reading some scripted prayer. I'm just talking from my heart to our Creator, just like if you and I were, if we were just having a conversation. Because I believe that's what real prayer is. So, so Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. And I, I don't even know really in what way you intend to take this truth today and speak to us in our lives. But I would imagine on every, on, for every individual, on some level, there's this sense that we need to not do something just because we've always done it. That traditions are wonderful. But truly, we want the leading of your Holy Spirit. We want the voice of your Spirit guiding and directing and ordering our steps. So, Lord, first I just want to pray about this area of no false fasting. No fake fasting. And, and that is sort of a code language for a lot of different things. Really, the point of it is, Lord, we don't want to have a rigid, ritualistic relationship with You. We want it to be life-giving and sustaining. So speak to us, each one, about our routines. Don't let us ever just get in the habit of reading the Scripture and letting our eyes just go across the ink on the page. But help us to really engage Your Holy Word. And please, God, don't let prayer for us, don't let it be like checking off an item on a list. Okay, I did that, now I can get on to something more important. As if, as if we approach, approach conversation with you in a way that, that we just check it off the list and think, whew, now I can get on to the next item on my to-do list. Let prayer be life-giving for every one of us. Teach us to pray. Oh God, this area of purity. We want to be pure. I don't know any one of us that doesn't want that. We want to be pure vessels devoted to you, your servants. It means something to us when we see that label and it says 100% pure honey. Could it be that each of us, when you look at us, you would be able to say, He is 100% pure. She is 100% pure. Right now in this moment, if there is anything that we need to lay at your feet, we ask Holy Spirit that you would just come and sift out of us anything that's impure. Just bring it to the surface of our mind and our thinking as we pour out our confession to you, as we recommit to a lifestyle of holiness walking with you. And then this area of idols. No false idols. This is where we need your help, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Is there an idol in my life? Is there something that maybe I would never say it's more important than you, but my actions show that actually it's more important to me than you? At that point, it becomes an idol, and it, it needs to go. It, it needs to... We need to make adjustments. There, there needs to be some modification. Show us. It means something different to each one of us, God. Speak to us, oh God. Give us your favor. Help our traditions to be true. 
true to you. So we come to you. We are weary and burdened. You promised us you will give us rest. We take your yoke. We learn from you because you are gentle and humble in heart. We will find rest for our souls. We give you thanks because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mom.